We are not this time, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Ronald Rigorsini for uh, decades now, and we have participated in many uh, uh, conferences. Uh, his publications uh, take two pages, so you know, I, uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, Professor Sini is the Charles Steely Collegiate Professor of Social and Political History, Emeritus Professor of Political Science and History at the University of Chicago, and Senior Researcher, National Research University, Higher School of Economics, St. Petersburg, Russia. He is the grandson of the composer and ethnomusicologist uh, Grigor Mirzayan Suni. He was the first holder of the Alex Manuel in modern Armenian history at the University of Michigan from 1981 to 1995, where he founded and directed the Armenian Studies program. His publications are outright uh, mind boggling. Uh, they stretch from uh, Russian history, Russian imperial history, to Soviet history, the role of intellectuals. Uh, I will just mention, and I hope he doesn't mind, just a couple of, of volumes. The very important uh, collection of uh, essays uh, coming from the workshop on Armeno Turkish scholarship. Uh, Ron edited that volume along with Professor Grigge Göcek and Norman Neymar. A question of genocides, Armenians and Turks at the end of the uh, Ottoman uh, Empire, and uh, the brand new uh, book, uh, which I believe uh, uh, is entitled They Can Live in the Desert But Nowhere Else A History of the Armenian Genocide, Princeton University. Uh, 15. Having read the summary of that volume, I got the impression that we finally have a readable one-volume uh, textbook on the Armenian uh, genocide. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Ron. He will be talking about this book, I believe. Stefan, I, I can't speak in that beautiful French accent. I would try, but it would not work. So I will, I will speak in my own accent. Uh, I remember years ago that a famous uh, and very important Armenian scholar said, I know you're going to speak, Ron, about genocide and you're speaking to a largely Armenian audience. You know, I, I, I know the subject is terrible, but could you make it a little upbeat? <laughs> That's difficult to do, but I, I, I want to talk today a word that in fact conjures up images of the most Tremendous crimes that can by states against de designated peoples. This term, genocide, is so powerful as a concept in international law, a claim by governments of their own victimization. You almost have to have a genocide in your uh, or else you don't really qualify as a state anymore. Uh, and as powerful sources of national identification, that the term genocide has been either narrowed to only involve the Holocaust of the Jews, the Judea side, or expanded so broadly to involve almost all instances of mass killing in our world. Uh, in the book that I've written, They Can Live in the Desert But Nowhere Else, uh, I have employed the word genocide in a specific way to designate what in German is called Volkermord, the murder of a people, and in Turkish, Solkerim, or in Armenian, Sekaspanuchun. That is the killing of an ethnicity, or in an older understanding, race. In other words, in my view and in this book, mass murder in and of itself does not a genocide make. Although legal definitions do not capture the full range of historical examples, there is utility in my mind to restricting the term to what might more accurately be called ethnocide. That is the deliberate attempt to eliminate a designated group defined by cultural characteristics, language, imagined biological race perhaps, religion, and that these characteristics have historically bound these people together as a community 
and appear to distinguish that people from others. While other forms of mass killing, war, massacres, induced famines, the great purges, all involve death on a horrendous scale, the motivations and intentions of the perpetrators are different enough from these ethnocides that they require, in my mind, distinct explanations. Genocide, in other words, is not the murder of people, but the murder of a people. In his first publication, using the term that he had coined, the lawyer Raphael Lemkin explained, and I quote, the practice of extermination nations and ethnic groups as carried out by the invaders, that is the Nazis, is called by the author genocide, a term deriving from the Greek word genos, tribe, race, and of the Latin side, by way of analogy, see homicide, fratricide, etc. Unquote. As difficult as it is to discern, intentionality is key to as the starting point, uh, and death is the result of the intention to eliminate whole peoples, or at least render them impotent. Genocide, thus, is ethnically inspired violence, but should be distinguished from ethnic cleansing, which may entail killing, but more immediately involves displacement and deportation, the physical removal, the, move, the moving, the deportation of a distinct population. Uh, ethnic cleansing is when you want the land, but you don't want the people on it. American Indians or Australian Aborigines, whether it was Chechens, Kalmyks, Crimean Tartars, Volga Germans, or other Soviet peoples, Palestinians in what is now Israel, or Kurds in Turkey, this ethnic cleansing is often accompanied by a loss of life, and killing is often an instrument to force people to move. The physical removal of people, because you want the land but not the people, then is closely related to genocide, but may or may not require mass murder. The imperial ambitions of Europeans and the subsequent settler colonialisms, beginning immediately after the discovery of America in the 15th century and continuing through our own 21st century, has resulted, as we know, in horrendous violence and forced movement of peoples. Brutal precedents to the policies carried out by the young Turks and the Nazis. Ethnic cleansing and genocide, of course, bleed into one another. And the Armenian genocide is an example uh, of ethnic cleansing, deportation, dispersal. These Armenians will not constitute anywhere more than 5% of the population. Uh, but it also accompanied killing massively, massacres, uh, the, uh, uh, forced starvation, as well as forced assimilation and Islamization mostly of women and children. This is a very gendered genocide. But uh, it seems to me it's useful uh, heuristically or analytically to keep these terms ethnic cleansing and genocide apart. The genocidal elimination, of course, need not be total, but it should re render that people impotent politically and possibly culturally. Few modern mass killings or even genocides have resulted in the total liquidation of a people. And both the Armenian and Jewish genocides resulted, as we know, in new states being formed and populated with survivors and their descendants. But the mass of Armenians never returned to the historic homeland in Anatolia that they had inhabited over 3,000 years. And the Jews, while hardly totally erased, never reconstituted the vibrant Yiddish culture that they had evolved over many centuries in Central and Eastern Europe. Those genocides had results. They were genocidal in the physical, political, and cultural sense. Although on moral grounds, one form of mass killing is as reprehensible as another, the framers of the Genocide Convention may have done with us historians and political scientists a favor limiting the of the United Nations, United Nations Convention on the and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, December 9, 1948. I quote, genocide means any of the following acts committed with an intent to destroy in whole or part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group as such as A, killing members of the group, B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, 
see uh, inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Uh, D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. E, forcibly transferring children of the group to another, another group. All of that sounds very familiar in the Army. This is a capacious definition, but the UN's, uh, United Nations conception has now been standard. And, sorry? Oh, I can speak loudly, though. This is a rather capacious definition, and the UN's conception has become standard and widely accepted, even as it has become contested. It seems to me that is the most useful way to talk about genocide, not to try to shift the definition too much and include more and more examples. Now, we know that somewhere conservatively between 600,000 and a million Armenians or more were destroyed in this genocide of 1915-1916. Uh, and that further losses in the half decade after the war, when Armenians fought the nationalist Turks, when they were driven out of Cilicia, Izmir, and Elsmer, continued to raise the total. The 20th century had not yet witnessed at that time such a colossal loss of life directed at a particular people by a government. There wasn't even a term for it, and so they used the word Holocaust, borrowing from the Bible. Mass killing of this magnitude, the, the greatest uh, atrocity of its kind in World War I, made the unthinkable thinkable, and the political engineers that emerged from the Great War were able then to calculate higher human costs as their population policies, whether directed against ethnic groups or class enemies, as in the Soviet Union, reshaped whole societies. The purpose of the Armenian genocide was to eliminate the perceived threat of the Armenians within the Ottoman Empire by reducing their numbers and scattering them in isolated, distant places. The destruction of the Edmini Medeti was carried out in three different but related ways. As I mentioned, dispersion, massacre, and assimilation by conversion into Islam. A perfectly rational, or we could say rationalist explanation then, for the genocide appears to be adequate and has been used by the deniers. That is a national security argument, a raison d'etat. A strategic goal by the young Turks to secure the empire by elimination of what they understood to be an existential threat to the state and to the Turkish or Islamic. The young Turks were determined to save their empire. They imagined this internal threat, and they believed something had to be done about it. Paradigmatic nation state, the way the Kemal later, but they were going to change the nature of that empire so that one imperial nation, mainly the Turks, they even suspect Turks and Arabs of not being trustworthy dominate this Helenfurt uh, over the other nations. For one of the most radical of Turkish nationalists, Ziyad Gokal, uh, he wrote, the people is like a garden. We are supposed to be the gardeners. First the bad shoots are to be cut, and then the skyan is to be grafted, unquote. So this, what the book tries to show is the growing disposition, this affective, emotional disposition which grew more and more virulent within the Ottoman elite long before the war. And some extremists contemplated radical solutions to the Armenian question, particularly during and after the Balkan Wars. But it was the World War that only presented an opportunity for carrying out the revolutionary program against Armenians, but provided the particular conjuncture, radicalization and intensification that convinced the young Turk triumvirate to deploy ethnic cleansing and genocide against the Armenians. The moment at which that disposition, that proclivity toward violence became action occurred only after the outbreak of the war when the leaders feared that their rule was in peril, when they focused on the Armenians as that wedge that the Russians and other powers could use to pry apart their empire. Had there been no world war, there would have been no genocide. Not only because there would have been no fog of war to cover up the events, but because the radical sense of endangerment 
among Turks would not have been as acute. Without the war, there would have been less motivation for a revolutionary solution and many more political opportunities for negotiation and compromise. Very interestingly, on the eve of the war, the Young Turks had decided to sign up with the Germans. They were going to join the Germans. But at the same time, the Turks, being a little bit devious, they decided also to negotiate with the British and, and the French, and particularly the Russians. And Talat Pasha even went to Crimea. You all know where Crimea is now, right? Uh, Crimea uh, to meet with Nicholas II and Sazonov, the foreign minister, and tried to make a deal. We'll give up those Germans if you give us a deal. But the Russians and the British insisted on implementation of the reform of 1914, that is, Christian inspectors in the Armenian six vilayets. And the young Turks said, no, we'll go with the Germans. The Germans will look the other way, which is precisely what they did. So there are lots of causes. There are too many causes. Historians love causes. We throw everything we can at an explanation. We overdetermine things, right? Political scientists want something more, uh, you know, parsimonious. So I'm trying, by talking about affective disposition, to throw all those ingredients in the pot, all of which then help make this mentality, this affective disposition, which led to genocide. For Zia Gokol, like so many others who saw the genocide as necessary, or even force on the Ottomans, he could with confidence write the following. Quote, there was no Armenian massacre. There was a Turkish-Armenian arrangement. They stabbed us in the back. We stabbed them back. What was done, I un unquote now, uh, was done in the name of national security. Right? Not racial theory. Not like the Nazis. National security. A justification which still exists with us today and is seen by deniers and others as permissible for taking one of your recalcitrant peoples. Rather than a simple clash of religion or rival nationalisms, the genocide occurred because of a strategic vision of what the Ottoman Empire should become, a vision colored by the passions of the Ottoman leaders, their propensity for violence, and this affective disposition of hostility which included the powerful emotions of anger at what the Armenians had done, fear, resentment, and hatred. The disposition, that emotional universe that the Ottomans constructed made possible the most brutal reprisals against perceived enemies. And it developed over half a century. Still, this emotional coloring of others need not to have led to genocide. It was men, men particularly, who made choices. In a particular conjunction, when war and invasion threatened defeat and dismemberment of the empire, the young Turks took this disastrous, even self-destructive policy decision. It whole peoples, Armenians and Assyrians in particular, and accelerated, indeed, the moment of their own destruction. Those who perpetrated genocide appeared to operate within their own delusional rationality. The Armenian Genocide, I would conclude, and I hope this is a little bit upbeat, I'm not sure after what I just <laughs> The Armenian Genocide, the killing of the Assyrians, and the expulsion later of the Anatolian Greeks, laid the ground for a more homogeneous nation state that arose of empire. Like many other states, Australia, Israel, the United States, the emergence of the Republic of Turkey involved the removal and subordination of native peoples who had lived on its territory prior to its founding. We can see that in the making of nations, or even in the last years of an empire trying to reform itself, the connection between ethnic cleansing or genocide, and what later would become the idea of legitimacy of new national states. This search for legitimacy, this erasure of the ugly past, of the foundational crimes on which modern states, including Turkey, Israel, and even the United States, have been founded, uh, is what leads to these desperate efforts to deny or distort the history of the nation and the state's genocide. If you want something upbeat, then, coming to terms with that history, maybe the kind of conference that Stepan has organized here, maybe can have a salutary effect of questioning such continued policies of ethnic homogenization and the refusal to recognize the claims and rights of those peoples, minorities, and diasporas 
which include Aborigines, Native Americans, Kurds, Palestinians, Assyrians, or Armenians, people who refuse to disappear. Thank you. <laughs>